Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Today, my special guest is Corey Pickett. He has been working with us here at Parker's New Vision for several months, but he's really been in eye care, working with planning LASIK, planning Contour for 25 years now. He recently, two weeks ago, celebrated the 25th anniversary of he himself getting LASIK, which really changed the trajectory of his career. And something else very special happened to coincide with that 25th anniversary, which we'll talk about in a second. That really brings us to the topic of today, which is the newest innovation in LASIK, which is Wavelight Plus LASIK, which is kind of the successor to Contour and WFO Plus LASIK by Alcon. So if you could just kind of introduce yourself and tell us about your past history experience with LASIK and what special happened two weeks ago. Gotcha. Well, yeah, it's uh, cool to be a part of this. Um, so, yeah, I'm Corey Pickett. I, I, I've been in refractive surgery for more than half my life now. I uh, underwent LASIK in 2000 and, and started working with my surgeon then. Uh, since then, i uh, been part of kind of the introduction of uh, the kind of the wavefront guided procedures that were introduced 20 plus years ago um, and more recently over the last decade uh, really pretty intimately working with uh, topography guided treatments and really took an interest in it and uh, more recently in the, the Wavelight Plus been studying it for a while and very excited to have it now available to us here in the United States. Awesome. So you have some of the earliest experience with Wavelight Plus of anybody so can you tell us about that? Yeah so uh, just to show you how how much I believe in the technology. My daughter uh, was actually the first patient in the United States uh, post-approval to undergo uh, Wavelight Plus LASIK uh, about two weeks ago. So three days after my 20 year anniversary, 25 year anniversary. That's awesome. And that was uh, Dr. Mark Lobanoff. Yes. And you helped plan it like you've helped plan so many other LASIKs. I did. And uh, it was really cool. It's really different. And uh, I got to say that Planning a treatment for your child is uh, as as as, ner- as nerve wracking as, as I've had in, with any uh, treatment I've planned. So, if we could just start by, can you just describe what the new innovation is really, and how is Wavelight Plus different from Contura, from Wavefront Optimized? Sure. Well, as we know, with with Wavefront Optimized treatments, they're great, and uh, they basically you know treat based off the refractive error and a few modifications. Uh, when topography guided. Uh, treatments got added uh, back in, uh, I guess, 2016 here in the United States. Uh, it basically takes the anterior corneal uh, irregularities and factors those into uh, the treatments. Um, but some of the challenges in that is, you know, all of the different points of refraction uh, within the eye. So to me, what Wavelight Plus has added is it is a single device that allows us to uh, map all of the areas that impact the refraction and then it creates a very specific model of that eye to try to create the the most precise uh, treatment algorithm for that particular eye. So is it fair to say um, Contour is mostly topography guided and uh, Wavelight Plus is going to be more ray tracing? Yes, yeah, the ray tracing component of it is um, you know, it's different than, than a wavefront guided, which is kind of based off a theoretical model. This is actually that model, I think Alcon uses the term Ivatar, uh, where it's basically a, a copy of that particular eye, and then it will produce it over and over and over again to try to create that exact uh, proper uh, digital footprint, so to speak, of that eye. And so what all goes into it? Obviously, the cornea, both anterior, posterior... Um, curvature, the lens, and also vitreous, just the entire optical system? It's everything. So when you're doing the device, and it's a single device, they call it the sight map, and it's a play modification of the uh, Pentacam AXL wave. So we actually have the image up uh, of my daughter, and uh, the first thing you get is a a wavefront, kind of an ocular wavefront Mm -hmm. image of of the eye, and you take multiple images, and uh, that gives you pupil size and all that. You have to have a certain size pupil, just like you would with any other kind of wavefront driven. Uh, it has to be enough data in order to interpret it. And then uh, you get an axial length measurement, uh, and then you get a few of those, and then it does a, a shine flu image for anterior and posterior cornea and thickness and that kind of thing. Okay, so it models the entire optical system, right. kind of front to back, and then factors in not only refractive error, but also higher order aberrations you got it and you have all of the same outputs that you would um mostly from from the the pentacam axl wave and then but that's not where the magic you know 
finish this. Once you have all that data, then that data is uh, transferred over to your planning station or your laser. And then you get the ability to, you know, individually look at the refractions, uh, see if there's anything you want to take away. You look at the, the HOA profile, you look at the topography profile, make sure it all matches up. And then once that's done, that's where the magic happens. And you can see the device thinking and it's comparing, you know, the uh, all those ray traced models over and over and over again and then it gives a recommended uh prescription based off that there's no nomogram you have to run it through or Mm, planning software you have to run it through and that process takes a few seconds um the what was interesting about it is that it didn't follow necessarily like a uh, vertex adjustment Mm -hmm. so you know sometimes in the higher corrections you know when we calculate some of these other treatments we vertex down that's not the case in this Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was definitely a uh, kind of a pucker factor uh, for calculating your daughter's treatment with that (laughs) makes sense though just the way it's measuring exactly I would definitely want to talk about the actual planning process but if you could, could you just talk to us a little bit about what we're seeing here so this is actually a display. So once that data that you've got off the site map is like you like it and, and you can send that data over uh, to your planning station. And that's where at that point you would enter in your refraction. And remember I said earlier, don't enter in the refraction before you take the images. Otherwise you may be setting yourself up for more complicated things. But anyway, uh, if you're familiar with the wave light thing, you have your different, you know, your patient demographics and your planning and then the final treatment and all that. So this is, you're entering in the, uh, the screen here to where this is the display of all the information that came in previously. So this is your higher order aberration map. This is your topographical uh, map, your anterior topography. Don't pay too close of attention to that. It may look like it's a lot of noise, but the scale is a little too close together. They're 0.1 different. So it'll show some noise that may not actually be there. You've got your anatomy there with your anterior chamber depth and axial length. The, wave, the measured wavefront refraction at four millimeters and then your her total wavefront refraction based off you know her individual pupil. Um, and then uh, you have the capability to click on this button and it'll open up all of the maps. So all of the HOA maps that we've taken and you can single one out that you wanna get rid of. And then that will in turn kind of change the refractions. And you can do the same thing with the topography to, to single out any maps that you don't like. And then once you've kind of got it where you want, you go to another screen and then it creates that, um, uh, starts to, to calibrate and calibrate. So it's taking that eye model and then uh, it's trying to dial that in with the ray tracing to try to find the smallest point spread function point, that smallest point. And it's creating that recommended treatment profile based on that. One thing I noticed on these was that usually when we have a higher myope that you know we may vertex down, I think I mentioned this earlier, on this one it actually recommended hers treat a little bit more and she actually turned out you know very near plano at one day post-op but uh, as a dad i was worried that she may be a little bit overcorrected. so uh, it's really a very intuitive tool it's a different way of calculating it than we ever have and i would just encourage anybody that's getting started with it is don't don't consider it you know like an easy button yes we have one machine yes it has taken a lot of the the other effort out of of multi multiple uh devices that we have in the clinic but uh, you still need to, you know, do your part, you know, make sure you've got good maps. Don't send the junk over, you know, take all the pictures, go through them, you know, make sure you send good quality data over to the laser and then take the time, you know, this didn't only took us a few seconds, but we took the time to analyze each one of these things just to make sure there was no, no weird outlier that we sent over and uh, the outcomes can be just absolutely outstanding. Awesome. So definitely my next question is the the planning process. I've been pretty open with the fact that Contour is not easy necessarily to, to plan. And there is quite a few steps involved going back and forth between machines. Things like wavefront optimized LASIK use nomograms like IBRA, four cities. Contour, of course, uses four cities. So you said there's no nomogram here. So all the calculations are taking place internal to the device then? Yes. Yeah, and I think there still be, you know, kind of a, a factor as we have more data that you may make some modifications. But, um, you know, the, the this is a specific model. So you're not, all, everything we're doing is based off numbers and history mm-hmm. and all that, where this is something specific to this single eye. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you've got to take that into account when you're calculating these. And you said in some of the next phases, like steps up here is where you plug in things like refraction. Right. That's over at the planning station. This is from the site map itself. So the planning station uh, or on the laser itself is where you can go in and 
and you can select like if you don't like the HOA profile on one like you'll have mm-hmm. all your your enter uh, topography maps up for instance and you can if there's one that doesn't match you can deselect that and then that'll start to change all those calculations based off taking one of those out for instance so having planned so many contouras uh you think this is going to be quite easier than because everything's in one machine in theory yes but what i what i worry about is the um you know the underestimation underestimating the um you know the quality of the images and just you know just like we and we can fall in that trap with doing other devices, right? If you don't really look at the quality of the image, you're just looking at the data that it kicks out. You have to be really careful, make sure, say, you know, all the pupil sizes are relatively the same and all those. And that's where you get the, still get the power to do that, you know, at the device. But it's nice to not have to go to three or four different devices mm-hmm. to do that. And then also with the uh, final numbers that you're running, you don't have to go run it through a third-party type nomogram or anything like that. It's all done right there. So you think they're... Just like Vario, there might be a learning curve for yes. the ancillary staff to help obtain right. those good images. Yeah, if, if you have a Pentacam AXL wave in your clinic, then you're going to be able to adapt to this pretty nicely. Um, I, I feel like you should do that probably first in your clinic, just like you would with a Vario or anything else. But yeah, I think it should, in theory, don't underestimate how long it takes for that image to process, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. instead of it, you, you save your time in having to go to multiple things. And by first, you just mean... You know, we're planning to dilate people in the clinic. We're going to do stuff to their eye. So the very first thing, we talk about this with Contour, too, right. is just while the eye is as pristine as it's going to be, get these images kind yes. of up front. Yeah. So my last major question here is, who do you think this is best for? Well, the, the approval, for, and, you know, Alcon could correct me if I'm wrong, but you have to be at least a spherical equivalent of minus one up to minus eight. So it's got similar approval parameters to what uh, Contura has, mm-hmm. uh, with, but they do have to be at least minus one. They can't be less than that. Um, I think for patients that have maybe a little bit more corneal irregularity, I still may favor Contura. Mm-hmm. Um, for that, and I don't want to ever devalue that because, you know, I was part of a study that published some of the best LASIK outcomes that have ever been published with, with Contura. But in theory, for, you know, a majority of patients, this, this may provide uh, more even consistent, uh, better outcomes without having to um, interpret other things. Mm. So just out of curiosity, you know, we do a lot of the cross-linking PRK combos. So patients like that with, with cones and things, do you think... Contour would still be favorable for them? or I think so. I don't like the idea of anything wavefront driven when it comes to, uh, you know, anything keratoconic. I feel, I feel like, uh, you know, just taking into account that anterior topography is still better. Okay, one more question, because this is something I wondered about. I'm sure other people are wondering about. Do you have any hesitation at all? So, you know, we said we're taking the optical system of the entire eye, so that's front to back, that includes lens, which, you know, the lens will change. Yes. So how do you feel about if there's any lens irregularities that might change over time and kind of correcting those and baking that into the cornea? Is that a concern at all? It's always been a concern of mine uh, when it comes to this, um, especially as, you know, the patients get a little older, um, you know, I don't know in the long run if it really makes because now we're seeing these patients that had wavefront guided 20 plus years ago mm-hmm. and now they're coming in with cataracts and we're not really taking that into account mm-hmm. you know so I don't know I think we made more of a deal out of that than, than it really was but on the flip side you know uh, yeah maybe in the younger patients you, I remember a long time ago you're making a cornea pay for the sins of inside mm-hmm. the eye you know um, but uh that's the only way you can get a ray traced model mm-hmm. is, is to, you know, take the lens into account. Whole thing, yeah. So, so then this w- might become the just default treatment for any eye uh, coming in the door, everything else being normal. Yeah, I mean, your higher cylinders, your, um, I don't know how it's going to do with larger angle alphas and mm-hmm. things like that. I think that's still, you know, stuff and not to ignore. Of course, we don't have hyperopia approval. I doubt we ever will. Um, mixed cylinder, you can't treat with it. Mm-hmm. I still think wafer and optimize has a place, and topography mm-hmm. got it has a place. But in your vast majority of, say, younger, healthy, myopic patients with kind of normal refractions and normal-sized pupils, I feel like this will probably be the gold standard. 
Awesome. Well, that is exciting. Refractive surgery is such an exciting field because there's new innovations like this all the time. And although this has been in an international market for yep. you know how, however many years, it's exciting to have this technology in the United States too, as we you know head towards the next innovation in LASIK, which is Wavelight Plus. So thanks for tuning in, and thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> all right. Yeah.